not want to refute any of your accusations, right? You don't want to say, ah, you probably feel like I haven't given you a fair shake. But as your boss and having all the other other things to consider, you know, what you didn't see was that all this other data that I had to look at in order to make the decision, right? That's that's refuting your accusations audit. So exactly to your point, you never want to put your butt in somebody else's face. I'm sure you feel this way, but this is actually what it is. That's what you want to leave out. If but and or because comes to mind during your accusations audit, you probably just want to replace it with silence. Don't don't say don't let the words come out of your mouth. Don't refute them because it's what those words do is it, it negates everything that came before. Yes, tone is going to be important. Again, circumstance drives your strategy. Generally, your tone in a situation with the accusations audit is, uh, you know, you, you don't necessarily want to have a curiosity tone because the things you lay in your accusations audit are things that you're sure of. You probably feel like you're getting passed up when you shouldn't be. It might even seem like, you know, you've been ignored or you, your, your real talents haven't been taken into account, right? You want to say it as almost a declarative tone. You want to say it as though you know it to be truth. This is how, as almost, almost to say, this is how I know you see the world. When you wake up in the morning, the sky looks green, the sun is purple, and there's giraffes in your yard. Right. That might not be true from your point of view. That doesn't change what they see. So, yeah, declarative tone. You want them to know that you see it also. These are also things that I see to be true. So you got employees that, again, are not listening to what you say. They're not executing. They're not batteries included. Right. They don't take initiative. They essentially wait for the boss to do this thing before they take action at all. And so what do you do? And so some of this, I would say, is going to be solved by an accusations audit. What is causing them to not execute in the way that is most desirable? Some of that's going to be based on what's going on in your environment. And so it might have to do with fairness. It might have to do with they don't feel like they're being put on the right projects or they feel like whatever's being assigned to them is beneath them or the way that they're being assigned is they may see it as being disrespectful. It could be any number of things. But going in with an accusations audit of you probably feel this way is going to leave you in one or two places. You're going to say, you know what, boss, that's exactly right. This is the way I wish that it worked out. Or they're going to say, boss, that's not actually it at all. It's this other thing. What does that tell you? You're going to be better informed by leading with the accusations audit because you're either going to be exactly on the money or they're going to say, no, that's not actually how I see it. I see it like this, boss. This is what I need you to know as your employee. Any any additional thoughts that you would add to that specific one there, Derek? Um, setting your clear expectations, summarizing the conversation, and once you have got an understanding slash agreement as to what the execution of whatever it looks like, you're going to want to you're going to want a rule of three. Uh, there are three types of yeses that you get from anybody, and that's counterfeit, um, confirmation, and commitment. And so once you've come to that understanding, that's your first yes. You're going to want to hit that yes at least twice more to un to make sure that you guys are on the same page. A yes without a how is worthless. So when they say, yes, boss, got it, I'm on my way, and they go out and execute, and they don't come back, it's ultimately your fault because you didn't get the confirmation yes and you didn't get the commitment yes. How do you get those commitment and confirmation yeses? Just simply label, mirror, or paraphrase what has just been said. They tell you, boss, I'm going to have this project to you by next Tuesday. Sounds like next Tuesday is a better day for you. Yes, that's your second yes. Your third yes is going to be, so if I understand you correctly, next Tuesday, by, my, by Monday night, you will have all of this thing wrapped up. And on Tuesday morning, when I come in, it'll be in my inbox waiting for my approval. Something to that effect. That's your third yes. And so once you've gotten them to, those are public promises. And it's very hard 
not impossible, but it's hard for people to go back on a promise that has been verbalized, that has been vocally stated. So when they when they speak it into the air, it's it's like going into a uh, a tablet with a chisel. That's that's all I wanted to add to that. When they have a valid argument, but it's not uh, it's not appropriate for the specific situation, find out what's the motivation. Seems like you have a reason for saying X and find out what their thinking was. And then I would follow that with a no oriented question. Would a bad idea, would it be a bad idea if I explained why that's not appropriate in this instance? Again, you're deferring, you're asking permission to give an explanation and then you lay it out. And then you lay out what would be appropriate for that situation. How do you lay that one out? With another no oriented question. Are you against? And then fill in the blank. What is appropriate for that situation? So I would listen to their side. Label, mirror, paraphrase, and then come up with a no oriented question. Are you against? Whatever it is for the appropriate situation. Would it be a bad idea if I explained to you why this was not appropriate? In regards to um, the survey results, a new manager recently promoted, unfortunately got promoted over someone in the organization that, and that someone felt like they deserved the promotion because they've been around longer. But the reality is this individual got promoted because they're go-getter, they're crushing it, they're killing it. And so the residual effects of that is they're dealing with a coworker who is now a subordinate that is now being very disruptive, doesn't want to have a decent conversation, sees them probably as the enemy in the office because they got passed up by this person. And so Derek, what would you offer this person as far as being able to solve that with this individual who is now a subordinate, who seems to be very obstinate because they feel like they got they got passed up for the promotion that, deserved, that they deserve. All right, so uh, there's a lot there to work with. Um, but a thumbnail sketch of what it, of what it should look like would be uh, you're going to have to address it. Uh, you're going to have to address the counterproductive behavior because it impacts your credibility as a leader. So you're going to have to have that one on one. How are you going to start that one on one? You're going to hit them with the accusations audit. I know that you uh, you, you don't have. Um, a lot of faith in me as a leader. I know you think that I'm probably not worthy of the position, blah, blah, blah. So you're going to string them out. And there's a lot there that you can throw into an accusations audit. Uh, last week during the meeting, I asked you to introduce yourself and you refused to do so. What caused that? Get the response, response label, label paraphrase, paraphrase, paraphrase response. Again, you're showing that tactical empathy and then you're going to hit them with the with the eye with the eye message to address the counterproductive behavior without sounding accusatory. When you display that type of insubordination in front of others, I feel frustrated because it undermines me as a leader. When you I feel because is a perfect way for you to tell this person, knock it off. I'm not going to stand for it anymore. And then the conversation can be switched into what the, your relationship is going to look like going forward, what the ramifications are going to be if the behavior is repeated in the future. So again, you see the sequencing. Tactical empathy first, your goal and objective last. In the, in the middle of that, we sandwiched in an I message which is used to confront counterproductive behavior without sounding confrontational, without accusing the other side. You're telling them to knock it off without actually using the word knock it off. That's exactly right. That's a, that's a great way, great comparison there.